Australian resident Jessica Wongso has been charged with the murder of Mina Salihin. Police allege she poisoned her friend by adding cyanide to her coffee. Dia Jessica itu kan kayak setan itu. Deep inside is something like the evil gitu. Yang dibilang the trial of the century itu betul. Evidence 14, CCTV2 footage deliberately converted from color to grayscale. CCTV2 footage was divided into two parts, the first part from 1355 Western Indonesian time to 1602 local time, as per the examination report of Muhammad Na al -Azah, and the second part from 1602 to 1806 local time, as per the examination report of Christopher Harriman Rianto. Metadata analysis of both parts of CCTV2 footage shows that the video has three color channels, YUV color space, indicating that CCTV2 footage is a color video. However, when displayed in court by Christopher Harriman Rianto, Muhammad Na al -Azah, and the prosecutor, the video turned into grayscale, only one channel. This confirms that CCTV2 footage was deliberately converted from YUV color space to grayscale. The forensic impact of this manipulation is very significant. The color information captured by camera 2 is crucial to provide details about the volume and color of the remaining coffee glass carried by Devi Siegian from the pantry to the cocktail bar. The color of the coffee glass should indicate whether there was any color change alleged to be caused by contamination or a harmful substance such as cyanide. This vital information was destroyed by Muhammad Na al -Azah and Christopher Harriman Rianto. Furthermore, the color information of Myrna Salihan's face and arms when she was taken in a wheelchair from table 54 out of the Olivier Café around 1728 local time should have been carefully analyzed. Skin color can show physical signs such as paleness or other color changes that might indicate certain medical conditions due to poisoning. This vital information was also deliberately destroyed by Muhammad Na al -Azah and Christopher Harriman Rianto. This video manipulation removes crucial visual evidence. The removal of color information by digital forensic experts, who should maintain the integrity of every bit of information in this video, demonstrates a serious breach of professional ethics. This manipulation not only obscures the truth of the events that occurred, but also undermines trust in the forensic analysis results presented in court. Manipulating the video from color to grayscale also casts a shadow over the credibility of the forensic experts involved. Forensic experts are expected to uphold the highest standards of integrity and ensure that the evidence they present is as accurate and unaltered as possible. The deliberate conversion of the video from its original color format to grayscale is a serious breach of these professional ethics. It suggests an intention to obscure or manipulate the evidence which can severely damage trust in the forensic findings and the judicial process as a whole. Moreover, the loss of color information limits the ability of all parties involved in the trial to see the complete picture. Judges and lawyers rely on video evidence to provide a clear and comprehensive understanding of the events in question. Color can influence perception and interpretation, making it a critical element of visual evidence. The absence of color can lead to misinterpretations or a lack of clarity about what actually transpired, thus potentially affecting the outcome of the trial and the delivery of justice. Finally, the manipulation of the video has broader implications for the judicial system. It highlights the importance of ensuring the integrity of digital evidence and the role of forensic experts in preserving this integrity. Any manipulation or alteration of evidence can lead to miscarriages of justice, where the guilty may go free, and the innocent may be wrongly convicted. This case underscores the need for stringent protocols and oversight in the handling and presentation of digital evidence to maintain public confidence in the judicial process and ensure that justice is served based on accurate and reliable evidence. Understanding the motives of Muhammad Na al -Azah and Christopher Harriman Rianto in converting the CCTV2 footage from color to grayscale requires a thorough examination of the context and potential benefits they might have sought to achieve in their efforts to criminalize Jessica Wongso. One possible motive could be to obscure specific details that would have been detrimental to their case against Wongso. By eliminating the color information, they might have intended to hide critical details in the coffee glass carried by Devi Siegian. The color information in the coffee could have provided crucial evidence refuting allegations of poisoning, 
and removing this evidence would weaken the defense's argument, thus strengthening the prosecution's case against Wang So. Another potential motive could be to create ambiguity and cast doubt on the reliability of the evidence. In a legal setting, the ability to introduce uncertainty can be a powerful strategy. By presenting a grayscale video, they might have aimed to make it harder for the defense to draw definitive conclusions about the events depicted. This ambiguity could work in favor of the prosecution by making it challenging for the defense to prove that poisoning did not occur. Essentially, by manipulating the video, they could create reasonable doubt in the minds of the judges about Wang So's innocence. Additionally, Muhammad Na Alaza and Christopher Harriman Rianto might have had personal or professional incentives to manipulate the evidence. They could have been acting under pressure from their superiors or from a public expectation to secure a conviction against Wang So. In high-profile legal battles, the pressure to win can sometimes lead individuals to engage in unethical behavior. If their careers or reputations were tied to the success of the case, they might have felt compelled to alter the evidence to increase their chances of achieving a conviction. Moreover, the manipulation of the video could have been part of a broader strategy to control the narrative and the perception of the forensic process. By presenting manipulated evidence, they might have intended to bolster the credibility of their case while discrediting the defense's argument. If they could ensure that the prosecution's evidence appeared consistent and reliable, it would strengthen their position and potentially lead to a conviction. This strategy hinges on controlling the flow of information and maintaining a favorable perception of the prosecution's case. Lastly, their actions might reflect a broader pattern of misconduct or systemic issues within the legal and forensic systems they operate in. If manipulating evidence is a common practice in their professional environment, they might have seen their actions as a standard, albeit unethical, part of prosecutorial conduct. This systemic issue would suggest that their motives are not just individual, but also a reflection of a corrupt system where such behavior is normalized or even encouraged. Addressing this would require not only holding the individuals accountable, but also implementing reforms to ensure the integrity of the legal and forensic processes.